Good afternoon. My name is Jarvis Grant, and I'm with the Black Power Coalition, and we're going to be interviewing today Roy Lewis. Uh, Roy Lewis is a photographer of great renown. Uh, I've known Roy since, God, it must have been like 1971, I think is when I probably first met Roy um, at Howard University. I was a young anthropology student. Um, but let's just get to it. Uh, we have a lot of great information that we're going to be getting this afternoon. And so uh, let's begin. Roy, welcome back to Washington, D.C. I hear that you were just in Chicago. Uh, yeah, Sad a time. couple of weeks. So what yeah. was that all about? Well, I was out visiting a um, screen film on Gwendolyn Brooks, sort of a premiere of a film called Riding, Striding, Reaching, and Teaching. And Miss Brooks is someone that I had a long association with. We, she was very active in poetry and writing and workshops in Chicago at a time when I was covering a lot of the events there. And uh, we became friends, really. And I was basically, she had lots of photographers, but I sort of stayed with it, and then we wound up at a school working together. Not together, but she was in English, I'm in media. media. And uh, I recommended to the chair that we do a film on her, and this film is one day. Just her going to school, that's really what it, because that was just gonna be, say, day one, maybe I might have two or three other days of poetry reading. But as it turned out, I wasn't able to <clears throat> continue working there and one of the byproducts was for me to get a copy of the uh, of the film, which I edited into a film. Okay. Yeah. That I had finished, you know, added Terry Collier, added some images of some of the things she was talking about in the interview, and uh, it turned out to be a nice little twenty-minute black and white film that I had sixteen millimeter, and I stopped screening it because of you know you can get mess up the sockets and just this year I had a transfer to DVD and uh, I was asked to bring it out to Chicago and screen it for the Poetry Festival. No, I'm sorry, the Poetry Foundation, which is a publication that Miss Brooks uh, got some of her first poetry in. And this publication is, is over 100 years old and so when she was a young writer this is the company, this is the magazine, uh, journal that uh, published some of the first work. Okay, so what year was that again that you made the film? 1969. 1969. Mm -hmm. I screened it for her, and mm -hmm. uh, I knew a young man named Roy Campanella Jr. who was at Harvard in the African Studies Department, and he invited me to show it there at, at Harvard, and that ambassador, somebody knew Miss Brooks, and so. But then I just stopped screening it because, uh, you know, I didn't want anything as my original. Right. And so I had it transferred. And uh, when I saw it, it's like it, even me, you know, I said, wow, I just in my beginning stages and editing. And I said, wow, you know, this is not bad because I inserted a lot of stills in it. Right. And I had Terry Call here. And some of the stuff, I, I was, didn't know totally what I was doing, but I actually it synced to the music of Terry and in some cases, sync to what she was saying. You know, I said, wow. I was, they didn't have videos back in those days. No, nope, no, nope, I remember well. But <laughs> it's so funny about that, how when you begin to put music and images together, after a while, they just start to naturally go together. That's amazing how that yeah, works. Was, I mean, you can literally see it. I mean, when you listen to Terry, you know, Terry lyrical, he was a poet in himself. He was a word poet himself. His words, I, we, Terry was sort of like almost a, a group of people who would really follow him. And, and, and he was actually at the school that day. <laughs> when we got there, I didn't even know it, he was there. So I took stills of him and then used a couple of tunes that I had already recorded with him. Mm -hmm. And I just slid them in because those are two iconic people now that are no longer with us. Terry's gone, Miss Brooks is gone. And in Chicago, they're selling Miss Brooks, uh, celebrating Miss Brooks' 100th. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That's truly amazing. Yeah. Now, you're not a native-born Chicago person. No. Uh, you're from Mississippi. Could you tell us something about your, uh, your upcoming? Well, 
they say that Chicago is just upper Mississippi, you know, <laughs> and so, so many people go to Chicago. But uh, yeah, I, I'm out of the Mississippi mud, as they say. And uh, I grew up in Mississippi, uh, finished high school in Mississippi, and uh, got my start there in so many ways in terms of church, family, uh, <clears throat> Uh, working at a black newspaper, which then kicked me into being able to, because of the mechanical stuff and printing, mm -hmm. get a job at Johnson because also my godmother knew him. Oh. Taught him in high school. And so when she gave me my instructions and a few bucks, you know, for my pocket for my trip to Chicago, tell him I said hello, tell Johnny I said hello. And so. Uh, I, I gave that story to the young lady who was giving me the tour of JPC building. And so she said, he's looking for a job, and I was. Mm -hmm. And so I got a, that was my start at Johnson at 19 years old, right out of high school. <laughs> but I had that mechanical stuff with the printing, right. with the newspaper. And so I tell people the blood, the ink is in the blood, under the fingernails. And so I kind of stayed close to newspapers, magazines throughout my career. And then later, television, the Black Journal and all of that. Okay. So it was in high school that you really fell into photography or was yeah, it Yeah, the editor after? was a, he had a camera, mm -hmm. you know, and he taught me a little bit and uh, jazz, listen to jazz. We had a jazz listener club oh, in my high okay. school. We'd go off, off stage. And, listen to records. So uh, there were these people that was placed in my life that kind of helped point me in the right direction. Okay, excellent, excellent. His name was Bill Williams. Bill Williams. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he was the editor of the uh, newspaper. newspaper. Uh, another Johnson there uh, mm -hmm. owned the, the newspaper. And so I went from one Johnson <laughs> to the other Johnson. Were they related? No, oh no, 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 just no, no. Uh, then I never, never even knew. Never, <laughs> I don't even think I told Mr. Johnson that. I probably did tell him I was working at a newspaper. Yeah. Okay, well, that sounds pretty cool. So I know you did a stint in the army. Um, you drafted. Uh, did you continue photography while you were there? <clears throat> yeah. I, when I say continue, I mean I had a box camp, you know, a, mm -hmm. a brownie in high school, in which I've just added a couple of those pictures to the exhibition everywhere. Mm -hmm. But being around and seeing the newspaper, because we literally print the paper in the shop where mm -hmm. we worked, and to see the paper being done, and sometimes work all night, go to school the next morning. I mean, to be involved with, with uh, something like that, it's really for, even though it was a trade issue, I was wanting to be a printer. Mm. You know, and so uh, when you get in, immersed in the actual production of things, it's different. It, it kind of stays with you. Then I moved to Johnson and subscription department and making sure you got your newspaper and your notification of your expiration and all of that. It, it, it hooked me into the black community in a way that uh, just sort of stayed with me. Well, you know, um, we think about printing back then before the digital revolution and everything. Mm. You know, um, everything is very hands on and you have the opportunity to firsthand make mistakes you can't deny. And you can correct them. Exactly, exactly, mm -hmm. which means that your next endeavor is going to be much, much better. Oh yeah. You know, much, much better. And it's not easy. I mean, now you just do something, blah, 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 blah but there, you, if you, set the, you miss the letter, you know, you gotta, you know, you don't catch it, you do the whole order, mm. somebody proves it and says, oh, no, no, you gotta do we do it. And this is a learning experience, you know, like the line, of, I never did line of type, I actually did hand for cards and for programs, you know, I would actually do set it mm -hmm. with each letter, you know, and, but that process, is something that it was a stickler when you move that into still photography or being having to deal with details or pay attention. You know, it translates. So you were in the subscription department mm -hmm. at Johnson when you first started. Mm -hmm. So when was your big photography break? Hmm. Well, I would say when I got the camera. You know, well, actually even before I went into service and 
I mean, um, uh, Bill William, he had a camera, and I don't know that he, he probably let me shoot it, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I'm in Ed Johnson, where you got Monita, well, Monita was in New York, but you had all these photographers, and you had the art department and the lab. And I spent as much time as I could in that area, you know, where I'd be at the, watching Herbert Temple do an ebony cover, or Norman Hunter do a jet cover, and watching, you know, and learning. And so I was always, even before I went to the service, because I started working with Mr. Johnson in 56. Mm -hmm. I got called to the service in 60. I mean, they almost had to come and get me because I, you know, <laughs> I was 23. I thought I had slid under, but oh, they got me. But I'll tell you, the thing is that by me having this experience working with those uh, machines, uh, the first address of where I in Remington ran, I was the machine operator. And so when I, every form I filled out in the service, this data processing, data processing, media machine. So I didn't even have to go to training, you know. I went straight to work, Fort Sam, you know, Big Red One, mm -hmm. uh, you know, headquarters company. I had bankers hours. I went to work at four in the afternoon, you know, so. Hey, that sounds pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah, it was. And, but anyway, walking to the mess hall one day, a uh, guy asked me, if you want to buy a camera? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and 40 bucks. Uh, I think it was 40, or maybe 20, 40 or 25. Mm -hmm. And so I gave him the money, he gave me the camera. <clears throat> I went and got a roll of film. That was it. And the rest is history. Well, <laughs> hopefully it'll still be his, because I'm still <laughs> taking pictures, you know, I'm still working at it. Yeah, well, still that's... Still learning, still learning. Yeah, definitely, so you've seen the whole transition then. Yes, well, I, you know, I never was a two in court. I mean, I knew about you know, at Johnson, some of the guys, graphics, and mm -hmm. I knew about them in the two and a quarter. I even tried to do a march with a two and a quarter, mm -hmm. uh, looking down. And, but it really, you know, was Hoss, not a Hasselblad, but uh, uh, one of the major. In major Raleigh? What, no, it was a step up from Raleigh. Oh, it was the okay. next step up. It was the Roly. I know the Roly because mm -hmm. a lot of the press people use Roly, but there was the next. There was another one that was a little step up. I think that mm -hmm. someone had. But anyway, mm -hmm. and I still have some of those eggs and some of the prints, man. The stuff that just, it was just anyway. Um, I um, it was doing, learn by doing, basically. But being around all these other photographers, I think the thing that really sort of showed me some of the power of a photographer was a guy named David Jackson who worked at Johnson at the time. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. David was somebody that walked around with a Hasselblad and a Leica. Mm -hmm. And he worked for New, uh, National Geographic, with very few blacks. I mean, he's working at Johnson, but he, uh, he's the photographer who went into uh, Mississippi and took the photographs of Emmett Till in mm -hmm. overalls, you know, in, in the cask and stuff. Mm -hmm. So he knew I was interested in photography. He knew you could sell the way I was always looking. <laughs> so at a Christmas party, I used to walk around with shades all the time. <laughs> in high school, I had shades on. So I, had, I mean, I'm sitting over there on the side of the wall and in my English tweed and shades on. And so he popped off a 180 on me, you read Hasselblad, man. And he brought me two of them and just gave me a three, I think it was three. Mm -hmm. Whoa. I mean, I'd never seen myself like that. I'm st I haven't even been in the service. I mean, I'm still around it, you know, not, but I go to a lot of concerts with people who guys, photographers, uh, Shapiro, I think his name was, get a, get a camera, get a Polaroid, anything. He just knew that mm -hmm. I was interested in. So once I got that camera and processed that first roll of film, you know, then I knew that, hey. That was it. That was it. Okay, cool. So you're in Chicago, it's the mid 60s, we'll say, we'll use that as a time frame. So what kind of shooting were you doing at that time? I mean, you were shooting for the magazine, but weren't you doing some other things as well? Well, you know, I was wor working in the subscription department and I had children to raise, so I did freelance work and mm -hmm. in a lab in my basement and processing and taking it in and taking assignments from Bob Johnson, you know, whenever I could get them. <clears throat> and and I, I don't know how it happened. Um, their photographer might have been busy that day and he gave me an assignment to cover Thelonious Mark at Ravenna uh, in 64. That was really early that, because I came back from the service 62 mm -hmm. and so that was pretty early but meanwhile I had been processing and shooting a lot of different things in Chicago and so <laughs> I went up and 
met Mark, you know, he's in the dressing room walking back and forth. You know, who is this guy? You know, but <laughs> I just stood there, you know, and watched him and photographed him. That wound up being my first picture in Jet, yeah. Okay, great, great. It's amazing how that seems to work that um, the access to musicians back then seemed to be so. E I won't say, yes, easy. It was easier, definitely easier than now because you didn't have managers and road managers and people to keep you away from them. You know? Exactly, exactly. I remember my first photograph like that was of Tina Turner. I just walked into a dressing room. Right. It's, it's amazing. And they want publicity. Right. You know, I remember, um, um, well, Angela, no, 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 Nancy Wilson, you know, mm. and I was kind of laying back. You know, she said, take the picture. You know, <laughs> you know, you know go ahead. You know, take the picture. You know, wind up being a wee best in Chad, you know. I mean, you, you, you have to be careful because you don't want to take anything that, you know, that's, that they don't want right. shown, you know what I mean? And, and some, th some people, I think, sometimes show some things that shouldn't be, and even especially now, you know, you right. really, everybody wants that shot that's right. going to be something. Paparazzi. Yeah, that, and see, I tell people I'm not a paparazzi. I've never been. I, 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 I think they give photography a bad name. I mean, they have to make a living. Right. But there should be some sort of guidelines, I think. Well, there's, ethics is always important. Right. You know, but with all of the cultural stuff that you were doing, how should I say this? Did you ever think that you would be moving towards being more of a, a chronicler or a documentator of activities in well, the black community? I think I always was that. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, when I finally read the definition of documentary, I said, that's what I've been doing. Because, you know, coming up in the church, you always had programs, Christmas and Easter, and then you're in a structured environment. And at school, uh, I was in one, we had plays, um, you know, I was played on the football team. So it's that structure that the school and the church underpinning in, in, in the community that I came up under. And so, uh, and I had great teachers. I mean, my teachers were like some of the best because they couldn't go to colleges. You know, they, you know, they weren't right. hiring them. And so we had some of the best teachers in my high school. I mean, I went through the whole, I started the Catholic school, Prince Street Elementary, Broomfield, then Sadie V. Mm -hmm. And so Sadie V was a new school that was built. It was supposed to be for another community, and this was 54, so we got it. Mm -hmm. And it was very modern. Even today, if you drove by today, it's still modern. It's still modern. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> We're fortunate then. So let's see, what was, you're in a lot of entertainment environments, a lot yeah. of uh, cultural environments. Um, when did you start making that conscious effort towards uh, political documentation? Well, if you're in photography and you work for a newspaper, a magazine, JET, for me, I always say JET was the first internet. Mm -hmm. In the sense that it compiled news from papers and all that, and then put them on one, one unit and sent it out you know, weekly. And you could get that magazine any place. Yeah, any place. It's, it's, I, I, I knew about Jet even before I left Mississippi. Jet, Muhammad Speak, Pittsburgh Courier. Because the, the porters would bring them down on the train and we, somebody sold them there. So it was introduced even before I left Mississippi. And by working at the paper, you know, it starts you off being focusing on news. News. And then you move up to a Johnson with, you know, Jet, Negro Digest, and Ebony. And then I began to have pictures in Ebony, you know. And so, like I said, I, Mr. Johnson, this is, I tell people when I'm talking or when I'm lecturing, I went to the Johnson Public Company University. It was my school. I mean, some of the writers and photographers there, they were major. They were Life Magazine. Uh, they were the top. And so I'm studying their work. When the product comes out, <clears throat> I study it, you know. And so uh, the Ebony, I mean, I was, when I was in Chicago this week, I went by Ebony's archive, library, mm -hmm. Mr. Johnson's, the, main, the, the big library, Basil Phillips Library, really, because he, well, Barris Phillips, Doris Saunders. These, these, you know, you go in this room, this building, this, this 
three sto two stories, straight up <laughs> books, you know, all this, and they said they've got to do some more because people are using them, their research, and they have all the evidence. This is what they call the art bank mm -hmm. in South Side of Chicago. And uh, the, I went in there and they had an ebony on the table with the gloves. And it was a black cover, Herbert Temple cover, during the 64, so five or something like that. And I looked at the, the head <laughs> where the mask with the photos mm -hmm. listing. I said, a Roy Lewis, Roy Lewis. I said, wow, wow. I, didn't, I, forg I had forgotten I had one. But I said, oh, oh, this is the lion, the lion's in the cub. And this is uh, John Coltrane one. And this is this one. I mean, all the same issue, which is really, it was about the 60s, you know, mm -hmm. about the po politics or something. And so I had a platform. I had, when I went out on the road with my exhibition in 67, October 1st, came right here to DC, Gaston Neal invited me to come to DC. And so people knew my work, Weeks Best and Jets, Ebony and Pictures and Jet. They knew my work. And so the work was out there in front of me. I tell photographers, you have to be published, get published. Pay attention. I mean, the art is fine. I mean, you look at the cold train, you ain't gonna see nothing no more arty than that. You know, I mean, everybody's done and done something with it. <laughs> Very few people know it's mine. But I understand why, you know, you can see his veins mm -hmm. playing. So when you see those veins and he's playing into the horn, you can hear the sound, you know, and so I understand. But we've come up in a society now where it's taught almost to use photographs, to paint, to do stuff. And I really think there's really something wrong with that. I mean, <laughs> you should really get your own, do your own stuff, man. Or at least contact the photographer and let's do a collaboration. But now it's sort of like standard procedure. Yeah, appropriation and uh, what people are talking about there. Artistic practice and the use of photography, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and like you're saying, to distill all of that image down to the essence and then somebody just do. Yeah, because then it's basically your idea. Right. See, nobody even deals with a photograph as an idea. You have an idea before you squeeze the shutter. You know, and depending on how good the idea is, how good the photo, or whether or not your technical skills, you know, I mean, all these things go in. And I tell the artists and the people who have two days to do a painting, or three days, or a week, or a month, or a year, we have a second. Less than that. Yep, that's right. Yeah, to make something happen. Yeah, so let's say, so you make that move to D.C. Was that just a temporary move to D.C.? Well, I came here first in 67 with my mm -hmm. exhibition, and then I came back in 73. 73. Yeah, to a move, you know, to, to, make to stay. Move. Okay. Basically, the college, to do the college thing and have access to going out of the country and, and be in one spot for my family. <laughs> Sounds good. So who were some of the personalities in Washington, D.C. that you were dealing with? Well, like I said, I met Gaston long before, uh, you know, well, three or four years before, and I knew other people who were, I mean, I knew a lot of people through the magazines mm -hmm. you know, because they were in there, Negro Digest. And Gaston had, had told me what script, I mean, well, the program, or what he was having his second anniversary of New School of African American Thought mm -hmm. <coughs> in 67, and so, he, Leroy Jones uh, was one of the headlines. It was a three-day weekend kind of thing, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And so, but I had met Leroy in Chicago, 65, 66, because I covered a lot of cultural stuff, mm -hmm. a lot of art stuff, and a lot of music stuff. And so the camera got me into situations by covering all this stuff that was, People knew who I was, and, and the thing is, the difference is, is when someone know you as a photographer, then they see your work in print in newspapers or magazines, and that's another thing. Right, they know you are a photographer. <coughs> right, right. So that's always good. Now, along with that, because I need to make a connection with the Black Power Movement, and it sounds like you were doing black power before the phrase was even coined. Yeah. Um, so now people are becoming more aware, as they like to say today, people were waking up or were woke. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the, 
I'll say events and personalities that kind of pushed you kind of deeper into that? Well, you know, Chicago, Chicago was a firebed, you know, there's so much going on there. <clears throat> Culturally, the writers, artists, musicians coming together. Um, and so I was in the middle of that in terms of not only just taking pictures of it, but actually being involved. It wasn't something I was looking at objectively from the outside, but I right. was in it. And, uh, you know, my, I had three children at that time, and I said to myself, if they, 10 years from now, 20 years, they, where were you, Dad, when all this was going on? So I, I not only wanted to be there, but also have a record of it. And as things evolved, that record extended into other people. I'm recording other people, you know. And so uh, a lot of these other people were named people in the politics and music and drama and all of that. And then I followed them. I don't mean literally following them, but if I had the opportunity to shoot, take pictures of them, I did. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, and then I moved from still photography into cinematography. Black Journal, you know, uh, Tony Brown, mm -hmm. Bill Grees. <coughs> Dan Lathan. These are people that I worked with. I worked on feature documentaries. You know, Save the Children with Operation Breadbasket. Uh, Watch that. Um, when We Were Kings with Ali and Zaire. And so it was a progression that leaving Mississippi, Johnson, I saw Bill Grees working on a, a, a was it film, uh, one of the sociological uh, books, something about black aesthetics or something like that. Who, <clears throat> but he came to Johnson and film. Mm -hmm. I saw him with that camera on his shoulder. I said, "Well, well that's what I want to be," you know. And so I migrated into that. And so uh, I, in Chicago, I kind of worked with SNCC people. You know, I was never officially a member of SNCC, but I worked with a lot of people who were Larry. Oh, wow, Larry's, can't think of his, his last name, but, but a lot of people there. And then they moved to D.C. and was still involved with stuff going on here. And then when I moved here, of course, I sort of continued to do the same thing. And, you know, Gaston Neal, Cortland, Mary Barry, all these people I was covering. Because it's one, it was in some cases part of my job in terms of what I work on publication. <coughs> and the other case was that I, I wanted to, to do this. You know, I wanted to be a part of, of, of this because I, I knew what was happening. I mean, I knew that this was, we were, I, I tell people, I told a young man in California who asked me about uh, what I hope to do. Mm -hmm. with my uh, photography, and I said, change the world. You know, if you can change an attitude, you know, you can change the world. Because that attitude, you know, might change somebody else's attitude. Mm -hmm. And so, that's how I see it. Photography, for me, I, I know what the impact of the pictures in Life Magazine and Ebony mm -hmm. of demonstrators. I know. So it's a ripple effect that right. you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking about it now. <coughs> it's like you were also a one-man shop media outlet. <laughs> I guess that was. You know, I mean, when I think back, just going back to that subscription stuff that you were doing, you know, having a sense of, for example, zones and neighborhoods and where these, oh, yeah, these yeah. things are you going. You had to. You had to. Zip codes and all that. Right. And then you just kind of take that, you know, you help to influence people in terms of their activities and trying to motivate folks by giving them, I'll say a subtle nudge yeah. into certain yeah. areas, yeah, just, you know, just to say, yeah, well, you know. And, um, you know, a lot of times we don't think about those subtle nudges as being activism. A lot of times people have a tendency to feel the man with the bullhorn or the woman yeah. at the mic is that. You can have it, but you can be in a room. A needs to meet B. They don't know each other, but you know both of them. And you know that if they come together, then they can do something together. You don't have to stand there and witness it. Either. You just 
A and B. I mean, I, I come out of, uh, you know, uh, I went through Antioch, which helped me a lot. It was just an extension of my education in Natchez, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. But a brother named Gustav Jackson, who was a, actually a, a geologist from Guyana, put together a program, a master's program, independent master's program out of Antioch in the late 670s, or no, middle 70s. And I enrolled. And my experiential, I had doc documentation of my record, of my spirit, of my physical photography record, got me in. And so I went through this program. And some of my textbook, Pia Apollo Fear, the Pedagogy of the Press. And uh, I went through that and finished it. As a matter of fact, Gasser was one of my modules that I used. You had modules that you had to create in a final major project. Mm -hmm. My final major project was Zaire with Ali. You know, so all these things are interlocked. And so one of the things that, the reason why I have been able to stay in it is that there was always a purpose. Now, this part of my life, it's about taking that purpose and, and finishing it. And there are a lot of people waiting on me to do that. What I say to them, don't wait on me. Let's, let's, let's do it together. Because I've done the, I've, I've already done the hard part, which is actually having the history. When I used to go cover something, I would cover it with two cameras, a color slide camera, a black and white camera, and a tape recorder. Put the tape recorder on the stage and shoot color and slide film. That was before color slide, before color neg, you know. And so, uh, because I knew that the world, like I knew that 60s weren't going to continue. I knew that color was coming. Black and white was a dominant thing when I started. I mean, color was all, it was being developed, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you have that sense of <clears throat> history, like I tell people, I'm more of a historian than a photographer. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'll put myself in there with anybody, but I'm saying, I'm just seeing, not seeing it just as a picture. I take a period of mirror, I take a period of picture of a mirror, uh, I, when I took a picture of Amiri, I thought about that first picture I took of Amiri. And, his, and all of his family, all his kids, Roz, all those people, I followed Amiri. Amiri has a timeline. Gwendolyn Brooks has a timeline. Margaret Walker has a timeline. You know? And so that physics course that I took with uh, my teacher, who had just been become an ancestor, Hawatha Nardington. Physics, that's science and philosophy. And so it helped to shape me early into dealing with something scientifically and, and a lot of times taking myself out of it, but just dealing with the facts that this is important. And as Mr. Brown, Sterling Brown, another one of my great, great heroes, said, Roy, everything is important now. Yeah, but I'm being more selected now. <laughs> <laughs> he told me, I asked him, I was at Harvard with him, and he, he, was, he, he was at the back door of this building, you know, I said, mm -hmm. He was staring, he really wanted this picture taken. I said, is it important? He said, everything is important, Roy. But now I, I say, well, I don't have to take a picture of everything anymore, though. Yeah, but, you know, to be compelled to do that, after a while, you do begin to go through some self-editing. Oh, yeah, yeah, you have to. I mean, select it. And yet, I mean, it's just, I mean, I've got all these projects going. And so I realized that, as Mr. Johnson told me, I said, Mr. Johnson, I've got this book, and that book is the Roy. One book. So that one book is everywhere with Roy Lewis now, and that's what I'm working on all now, along with other things. But uh, one of the things that kind of get me now, and I think that people are in control of us, photographers, writers, musicians, and they are setting the standards of what people see, curators. And, I mean, I don't, they have a job to do. Mm -hmm. But I think they've taken us out in terms of the selection of our work. We have to bring the work to them and put it on their desk. Then they make the selections. When books get ready to come out, they don't want to talk to you. They want to talk to their agent, your agent. You're no longer in the process. You show up after it's done. You go up, you sign your book. They might introduce you. And so I decided, okay, I want to have a, a room of, uh, what's the list of books that are the, the, in the academy that's the golden books of 
the main thing or the blue plan. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, I want to make a selection of what I consider my best work, what I consider my best work. And I said, okay, I like the number 360. Now, they don't mean 360, three individual photos, but I got montages with 40 pictures in it. Mm -hmm. So, but 360 degrees, so that if these are the binders, these are the bookends, mm -hmm. the book. As a matter of fact, I say, book on the wall. People never get it, you know, it's in, uh, everywhere with Roy Lewis. And then, of course, the important line, the important line, everywhere with Roy Lewis. But I added another line to that. People who show, great people whose shoulders we stand on, which is the most important, because that, in fact, are the people who I, I photograph. What I consider them, they are great people. And they, that's a man sitting with, with his son. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is what I consider one of my best photographs. It's taken in 65 in Chicago. I first call it father and son. Mm -hmm. But I named it mothering now because a lot of people, you know, the way right. he is, the way his hair, they, they think it's a woman sitting there with a the diaper bag, but it's a brother. And one of the great moments in my career with this exhibition in Chicago in 2011, mm -hmm. someone turned me on to both of them. I had them go to the same spot and I took a picture of this big guy who's 41 years old now. Mm -hmm. And then we took him to the show. And then I made sure that they, both him and his father and mother got copies of those. Great. Did the same thing with Fred Hampton, same thing with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's grandson. So what is that? That's anthropological. I was going to say that, that you are, because when I was at Howard, I was an anthropology mm -hmm. major. Mm -hmm. And I just wound up spending a lot of time over at the fine arts in the dark room. Yeah. Uh, but it was also at that time I had discovered something that they were just coining as uh, visual anthropology. Visual anthropology. You know, mm -hmm. where... And you had mentioned that several times this afternoon in terms of being there, but not, you know, so you could be able to, you're involved, you understand what everything is, but at the same time, there's a greater story. Bigger story. That you're trying to tell. And even if it is that brother with his child, that's a very important thing, especially in, I remember when dealing with my little girl, Mm -hmm. The whole concept of being a single father was so... Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Because that wasn't my place at that time. You know, that right. wasn't the icon that you were supposed to do that. No. no. Um, but, yeah, that, that, that is a very important thing. Um, well, I was a single father, so, you mm -hmm. know, and <laughs> I tell people, you really never know me until you meet my kids. That's some of my best work. That's what I say about my daughter. I says, my yeah, best work. My best you know, I look at work. them, and I don't see a mirror. I'm not, I, I'm not interested in a mirror. I'm interested in them being their own mirror, them, their own self, and they're all t three individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have their own mindset, you know. Um, uh, I love them dearly. Um, and, and so, but that's a motivating force that, you want to create a legacy, not only just for your name, but for them, and to change the, the patterns that happens in families so that you're creating new patterns. I know, for example, I, I basically teach all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I could be on a train. I love the little babies on the train, you know, and they are so query, curious, you know, they look mm -hmm. at you. And so I'll look at them and I'll play with them and build us up and so you get their attention. Mm -hmm. You know, and then they look at you and you look at them again. I was on a plane, a young lady was, the little baby was jumping up and down the seat, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm sitting behind her and the mother was just sort of, I looked at her, I said, I looked at her, a stern look and I said, the look, sit down. You know what I mean? I just said, sit down. <laughs> she, you know, she had almost probably, it seemed like it never, I wasn't shouting at her, I said, just sit down because mm -hmm. it's dangerous on a plane. Exactly. The plane drops like that, you know, and so it's like parenting. Right. You know, one of the great compliments was given to me by a sister who was, you know, very dear to me. She said I was a universal father. So that when you think of all children as being your children, so that you, you, you're interested in their welfare. I mean, I'm at the art opening at the, at the uh, African Art Museum. And the little baby's running around. You've got all these soft edges and stuff. And the parents are just 
So I, I kept an eye on her so that in case she was getting ready to do something that was injurious, that I would, I would be available. Right. It didn't cost me anything. It was just caring. And I think if we move that past, past little children, but to each other, so that we, when we see signs of, of needs, we don't wait until the person hit a brick wall. We don't wait until it's over, you know. This, this thing in Chicago this weekend was spectacular with Fulfill Koran, a uh, tribute to him, his 90th birthday. But some of the things that were said and done at that tribute should, should have been maybe said and done while he was still here, you know. Well, you know, that sounds like it is on automatic. All right, so <laughs> let's uh, the go The Million to Man March. Oh. The Million Man March. Yeah, this is a book that Third World Press put out. A lot of people didn't get big distribution. I think the book that got the big distribution was the uh, Million Man March, Black and White, Random House, which I had photos in, Harley Little and other people. The Deborah Willis book. Deborah Willis, yeah. This book was done by Haki Mahabuti and some of the contributors are major, major people. It's how they did it. It's mm -hmm. really papers on how they did it. Uh, this is my cover of the, you know, the big million, two million, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you go through here and historic event, the meaning of the Million Man March and the Day of Absence, re record before revival. We must go to the, this march in name of God. All well, those just titles, you know, but mm -hmm. all these people who were there, the march, the day of absence, and the movement, who can be born black, you know, Farrakhan. And so I have about 13 images in here and uh, the cover. So, you know, I went out there that day. It started very early for me. I was out there before sunrise and stayed until mid-afternoon because that was film, you know. We had to have it processed and then get it to the right, <laughs> get it to our editors, you know. But uh, it was a great day. I, 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 the harmonious work thing that the photographers and the technicians, you know, and everybody was doing their job because I think that sense of how important that was to the world, not just to the nation, but to the world, to see black men and women doing mm -hmm. that, you know, and I, it, was, it was one of the high points for me. Well, it was a great day, that was for sure. Definitely. Definitely. We, now, need, we need some more like that in these days and time. No, that's true. That's true. Um, but like you were saying, teaching every day, uh, making sure that that ripple happens. Yeah. Not, you know, not waiting for, for something big to happen. Because a lot of times people wait for the big thing, and then when it's over, they feel they've done their part. Yeah, sometimes when it's over, it's just beginning. It, well, for those who know, the work continues. Yeah, the, the, the film, my film, Riding and Striding, Reaching and Teaching, uh, Miss Brooks, she took a bus, an L, another L, then a bus to go to school to teach. And I followed her. I followed her, you know. And uh, this uh, video, uh, now the uh, film video, it's about... 18, 19 minutes, and I, I'm really, uh, once I do some, have it, you know, change, not change, but the best technical copy, mm -hmm. uh, and I've been told there are different ways to do it, yeah. uh, that uh, make it available. One of the things that I, in my screening it in Chicago on the 27th, 28th mm -hmm. of June, I said to, uh, the public people, I got about nearly 200 people at 12, 12 o'clock, that's a pretty good mm -hmm. daytime. And uh, I told them that I would love to see this film in the school system. Mm. She was a Nash, she was a Fort Laureate of Chicago, Illinois, and then of America. Of America. Mm -hmm. And this film is the black and white, and it's also a slice in the day, because we're going through the city and showing you scenes outside, buildings, projects that's been torn down. And um, this, this, the, what she's talking about, she read her poem, Wall of Respect. She read one from Mecca. And then Terry does two tunes. So uh, one is on Cedric Street and the other is going to Bowling Green. And so Terry Collier in Chicago is well known. And Terry has a career out there in the world because he was spending a lot of time overseas. He's an ancestor now. But Terry, folk singer, went through school all the way to PhD on programming. And he's the one who critiqued me on digital. Mm -hmm. Roy, digital music only goes so far. 
He can't hit the Dizzy's high, high note. Roy, color, fit, color digital, red, is not gonna be as red as that bright red. And I said, yo, I said, okay, I like that area up there where it can't go. And, and of course, some people are going back to menorah, listening to menorah music and stuff. And I, not that I'm going back to film, I, I still love film. But I think it's important to know what the technical limitations is, and then you can deal with it, you know. Well, yeah, that's the, that's really it. But you know, working mechanically, I think gives people a unique mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when people have moved away from film photography, you know, because they think it's not trendy anymore, I still see this image of the Kodak film manufacturing building being destroyed. Exploded. Oh, I never saw it. Did oh. that happen? Oh, <laughs> my God. Oh. And I, I and can see it. You just say, oh, that's going to be the end of the world. Right. <laughs> yeah. Said, yeah uh, that's, you'll be yeah. sorry Some you things, that. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I still want to go up to uh, Rochester and check out the archives. and uh, tech, They took it to so much a higher well, all of them, you know, all of them, Japan and Germany. But that Kodak film thing, man, that they did was like spectacular, really. You think about what you were able to do, you know, yeah, with yeah, it. True. In fact, it's funny, when you were talking, I was thinking about, I went, Winston Kennedy at Howard sent me to a, a four-day workshop at RIT. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that I remember more than anything was that uh, one of the instructors was saying that people are always confusing technology with instrumentation. And uh, this guy was also the topography instructor. And he mm -hmm. says, you know, we don't touch computers until like the third year. The first mm -hmm. two years, we're doing it the way you did it. Right. You know, we're yeah. setting in that type. Well, they first, they start with fonts that they draw. Right, and right. They design that. Right, right. Then right. they make the plate, you know. And, yeah. and that's important. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the thing that keeps me, there are several things that keep me on. One, studying with a photographer named Ted Williams, we had about five, maybe about 10 or 15, maybe 20 students, eight or nine months, and you know, never be satisfied, you know, and then he said, start early in your career with categories that you can add to, no matter where you are, you can add to those categories. And then the sergeant in the, in the lab who helped me process, learn how to process my first roll of film, and um, I got, from that first roll of film, I entered a contest, and I won second, because I really didn't know how to print. Mm -hmm. uh, the other young man who was from California and had a Carmen gear in the service, and so he probably <laughs> had been, you know, anyway, he won out. But the sergeant said to me, Lewis, uh, Private Lewis, he said, uh, you have the eye and never sacrifice your eye for technique. And that's what we're talking about, technique. And, and, and I later ran into people who thought that because they had a Blad or a Nike or a Liker, that, that was, they were better, they were, but, but you gotta see it first. Mm -hmm. Then you gotta be, know your camera enough to execute and get what you see. I, I basically play around with double exposures and stuff, but I basically want the person to see what I saw, you know, to look at it. I mean, I do double exposures. I mean, I'm one of those people that back in the day in film, if I run out of film, I would turn, I could turn the film back in halfway and start shooting again. Mm -hmm. I did it on, with, with, uh, with Sun Ra. Got some great stuff. I would think so with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we about, we about, are we about finished? Mm, I think so. But I want to know one thing. You have mentioned a couple of times, I wanted to talk something about songs of my people and that experience. Mm. But um, I also wanted to know about the um, Roy Lewis Everywhere project. Mm. I'm calling it a project as opposed to a book. Uh, I was in uh, New Orleans, and I think it was 2003, and you were having a one-man show there. Mm -hmm. Um, they were kind of landscapey, but people kinds of things that were uh, happening. It was something different. Southern, uh, it was uh, uh, River Road. Yeah. River Road. Yeah, River Road. Yeah. yeah, that's a project, you know, that Tom Den and I started uh, back in 75 to go along the river and shoot black communities along the river. 
And that evolved into a presentation to Toni Morrison at Random House that the book was going to be accepted, but then it got put on hold. Mm -hmm. Everywhere is, um, I have had several, uh, Walrus, I mean, uh, River Road, Festac, which is a whole nother deal, Second World Festival of African Art and Culture. But the Everywhere Project is all these Sterling Brown book, Gwen Blue, all these books, but some of them, some of that will be in everywhere. Some of those, some of those segments will be in there. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the book comes out and then I'm able to do the book on the mu music. I mean, like music, artists, uh, poets, all those categories mm -hmm. that, that Ted talked about are books within themselves with more poetry or more critique on art. But the overall everywhere with Roy Lewis is a little bit of all of them. Mm -hmm. in time and space so that it goes back to the early career to the last picture, you know, or to what I shot this weekend, mm -hmm. you know, and so then we cut it off and then we say, okay, we do a mock-up. I have, I have my niece who went to Morocco, man, a Rui went to Morocco and she took her iPhone and shot doors, Morocco mm -hmm. doors. And I said, yeah, you need a mock-up. She went, she's done the hard copy mock-up. Mm -hmm. I went out there, I looked at it, it's spectacular. And the one picture, that last picture, she wanted to show me all the pictures. I don't want to see all the pictures where So um, she had a picture of herself standing in the doorway in white. I said, mm -hmm. that's your picture for public relations. And in the book it says, because you're in the doorway. Mm -hmm. And uh, now she wants to go back and do the blue period. They were a place where they do blue ties. Morocco right. is of the blue, uh, uh, what's that, blue? The blue moss. Uh, the blue moss? No, no, no. The blue is the material, the dyes. Oh, the indigo. Dyes. Oh, indigo. Yeah. And so it's just a beautiful, it's like a book, like, you know, nice hard top book, but mm -hmm. it's a dummy that she can send to a publisher and uh, she can send to a publisher, you know. But anyway, everywhere is that book. And so um, it's an exhibition mm -hmm. that's traveled around. It started in New Orleans in 2008 at the Essen Music Festival mm -hmm. and went from there to DC Right, so Prince George's and then to DuSable and then the last one was in Natchez, Mississippi last year, my hometown, right. which I really, really felt good about. Yeah, yeah. But it's an ongoing project and I, I, I need to finish, to, to finish it, to put the, close the book on it so that I can work on the huge big thing of organization and, and preservation and what's going to happen, you know. Yeah, well. As I always tell people, that's what graduate students are for. So <laughs> I need I need graduate students. I need a little more than graduate students. Mm -hmm. so I need paid staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, man. Well, thanks a lot. It's been really interesting hearing your talks. Good, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, found out a lot about different things. And actually, seeing all those different phases of Roy Lewis everywhere coming together. So. By the way, the everywhere is not my title. It's what people say to me. I see you everywhere. And of course now, uh, Capital One has got it. They got it and gone. Jackson, you know, the actor, mm -hmm. he uses- Samuel Jackson. Every Samuel Jackson, right. he has a commercial now, you know, uh, he opens some doors, doors are moving around. Right. And then it says everywhere and all the doors fall down. I said, they, they need to send me a check. You know, oh, you man, know I'm, tell I'm them sure, to send me a but, check. But you know, it's so funny because <laughs> I was just telling somebody the other day, I remember when the show was going to be opening at the Brentwood Art Center. Yeah, yeah. And that was the one we had David Driscoll on the call, was on the invitation. Right. Oh. And uh, the funny thing was, I said, hey, you hear, you hear about Roy's show? I said, I said, yeah, Roy Lewis. So what's the name of this? I said, Roy Lewis everywhere? And he says, that's him. <laughs> he is always everywhere. Right, right, right. So. Yeah, by the way, I brought a gift for you. I have a, actually, you, did you get the invitation? They did great invitation, the black and white invitation with Driscoll. You know, I mm -hmm. remember they blew Driscoll up big That's because he's lived, what, four blocks down the street. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> so they, I had some, they had some leftover invitations. So I was going to present that to you and to the lady from the art agency mm -hmm. sign because they're collectible. That was a great. They really did a good job. I, I thought they could, I would have liked to have had a little more input. And um, one of the titles over, uh, you know, personalities. Mm -hmm. I have problems, I had problems with that. Okay. My work is not in the personality category. I, right. I, you know, we have to, they, sometimes we are grouped into personalities. And I, I think that Elijah Muhammad, Dorothy Hyde, Muhammad Ali are not, 
They are, but then this exhibition is about right. more than personality. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Which our work is. Mm -hmm. about more. We're not paparazzi. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, man. Thanks a lot. It's been a great afternoon. Take care. Okay. Thank you.